Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming and thanks for joining uh, via Zoom. Welcome to this to the presentation of this really great and amazing book called Extractive Bargains, Natural Resources and the State Society Nexus, edited by Paul, Paul Bowles, and Nathan Andrews. I should acknowledge that the presentation is part of the Policy Dialogues uh, seminar series of this center, the uh, Johns Hopkins University, Pompeo Fabra University Public Policy Center, um, fun acronym. Um, I wanted to thank also Professor Christos Zografos, who isn't here today, but uh, was Christos who offered uh, this space in the first place for the presentation and he contributed to the organization of this event. And thanks also to A Ribbons uh, for your help with the, throughout the process of the organization. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, here today, Professor Paul Bowles, the lead editor of this collect collection. Uh, Paul is Professor of Global and International Studies at the University of Northern British Columbia in so-called Canada. His work focuses on China's political economy, globalization, development, the international monetary system, and resource extraction. He's the author uh, or editor of 11 books, including the widely successful monograph Capitalism, which is kind of currently in its third edition. Thank you, Paul, for being here. And joining us from Vienna, uh, we have here today um, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Isabella Raduber, uh, one of the book's contributors. She's the lead author of one of the chapters in the book. Isabella is a fellow of the Transdisciplinary Academy, working on the political challenges posed by climate health interaction. At the time of writing this chapter, she was a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cambridge, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and the University of Vienna, uh, where she was later also employed. Isabella's research focuses on environmental and health politics, global inequalities, and decolonization. Thanks, Isabella, also for joining us. Uh, so for today's event, we will have two uh, presentation, two 20 minutes, 20 minute presentations, followed by uh, Q&A and discussion with the audience both here and connected online. Uh, we will start with Paul, who will introduce the book's main analytical and normative framework, uh, elaborating on this idea of the extractive bargains and also giving us an overview of all the contributions in the book. And then Isabella will present a chapter um, which explores how this uh, idea of extractive bargains plays out in the context of uh, plural economies in uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, Isabella's chapter is co-authored with um, our colleague uh, Mari Yasser and by myself. Uh, so Paul, um, you have the floor. I uh, guess I should pass you the keyboard and, mm -hmm. and, and mouse. And I guess I should switch off this mic and, and Paul opens this. Thank you very much, Diego. Thank, thank you, Abe. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Thank you for those joining us online. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Diego indicated, I'm here to talk about a, a new co-edited book um, that's uh, hot off the press. And in fact, uh, Diego has a copy and I don't. So it's... Uh, <laughs> obviously speeding its way here faster than it is to the remote parts of uh, British Columbia and Canada. Um, before I start on this book, just to say that, you know, it's co-edited with uh, my colleague, Nathan Andrews, and I'll talk a little bit about how Nathan and I uh, came to work on this by giving you a little bit of uh, background first. So uh, as was said in my introduction, uh, I've worked quite a lot on China's political economy in, in Asia for quite quite some quite some time, a uh, number of decades. And uh, living in, in northern British Columbia, I, I thought, well, uh, this will be a good place to live because it's uh, it'd be easy to get across the, uh, the Pacific and, and visit uh, Asia quite often. 
Um, but then about 10, 15 years ago, I found that it wasn't necessary as uh, China came knocking on the door to uh, northern BC, which is a resource-rich uh, profit part of the province. And so the, the gravitational pull of uh, the Chinese economy in, in the right in changing position in the global economy and the associated changes in the global political economy that went with that um, provided a, a, an opportunity for me to start looking at uh, how uh, the weight of, of China and Asia was reshaping the, the regional resource economy. And so I started working on these issues, looking at particular sectors like forestry and mining, uh, and in particular, uh, looking at pipelines, and did quite a lot of work on opposition and resistance to pipelines as the infrastructure for uh, fossil fuel exports. Um, so I've done quite a lot of work on that um, around uh, resistance and uh, uh, and changes in, in uh, extractive uh, policies as a result. Um, at the same time, I also became involved in a project called the Corporate Mapping Project, which looked at how uh, corporate power was uh, influencing and uh, obstructing uh, change. And there's a new book out um, edited by uh, William Carroll called Regime of Obstruction, which looks at uh, corporate power in, in this context. Um, and my, my colleague, Nathan Andrews, was uh, working on uh, similar types of issues in the context of, of Ghana, where he's from, uh, but also other African countries as well. He was looking particularly at CSR uh, types of, of issues and how those discourses were being used. Um, and as we were talking together, uh, one sort of uh, lacuna for us anyway was exactly what it, what is the state doing? Uh, in all this. So we've looked at sort of civil society, NGO resistance, indigenous resistance in, in Canada. We've looked at uh, corporations, but we didn't really have a very good understanding of what we felt that the state was doing. The state was always there as a player, um, but we weren't quite sure exactly uh, what it was doing. So this book is an attempt to uh, provide one more, just one more piece of, of the overall bigger puzzle. Uh, of, of uh, concerning uh, extractive activity. Um, so although it's come out as a book, nevertheless, it's uh, still exploratory in the sense that um, you know, we're looking at uh, developing a framework um, to unpack the different strategies taken by states to negotiate support for extractive and post-extractive -act activities. In other words, um, what we're trying to do is, is we based on 16 case studies, we're trying to distill, can we find some patterns across these states about how, the, how they're behaving? So um, there, are, there are many extensions which are possible. Uh, that's that's to, put a, to put it kindly. Uh, another way of looking at it is to say there are very large holes in the analysis, maybe sinkholes, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so so it, it is an attempt to... Uh, say, OK, as well as uh, the forms of uh, violence which we see uh, in various different forms which accompany resource extraction in different settings, um, there are also uh, other ways in which states try to um, gain support for their particular policies. So a paradox... Uh, seemed to be evident to us, and that was that the, the, the direct benefits of many resource extraction uh, activities in terms of employment, in terms of royalty payments, including uh, forms of taxation, um, seem to be uh, declining or seem to be not as, not as high as widely touted uh, by in many cases. So the, the, the sort of e the direct economic benefits because of the enclave nature and capital intensive nature of these industries, the direct employment benefits are often not that large. Um, royalty regimes have been subject to international competition and have been reduced over time um, with neoliberalism in many of these states. 
And so the direct economic benefits aren't all that have come come to be questioned at the same time as the ecological and environmental impacts and um, implications for indigenous rights have all increased so we've we've got this situation where the the benefits appear to be uh, not so large at the same time as the costs are trying to rise costs are uh, indicated to, to be rising so uh, in response to this, states have uh, uh, come up with uh, a number of broader societal claims and bolder claims for what uh, natural resource extraction uh, can provide. And so what we want to do is try and say, OK, can we look at uh, what these claims might be in some comparative political economy sort of way? So this is not to, you know, uh, deny the other issues of resistance and violence, but it is an attempt to focus on what else are states trying to do to construct um, support uh, for their particular policy stance. So uh, this requires uh, us to, uh, when well, we got, we brought 16 uh, authors together in a, in a workshop and ask them to consider these these questions to see what we could distill from there. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, well, we brought uh, sixteen uh, case study authors together in, in a workshop. Uh, to ask to ask them the question you know what it, what are states uh, what is your particular state uh, how is it acting uh, to try and uh, gain support for its policies and so um the state is, is of course plays a, a critical role in this it is the the regulatory authority um it sets the terms for approval and rejection of projects uh, it's it identifies who can be involved in, in assessment processes. Uh, it determines uh, who owns the subsurface rights. Uh, it has the uh, legal and uh, law and order forces uh, which can uh, uh, enforce its its uh, policies. So uh, it's very it is a, clearly a very important actor in in this which we need to consider. Um, as uh, been argued more strongly, it was central in, in birthing extractivism. Um, but rather than impose a, a single view of the state, um, it is uh, there are lots of different theoretical traditions on how one should analyze the state, and we didn't want to impose one theoretical tradition. Uh, on uh, on our authors, but rather provide them with some propositions uh, which might be compatible with a number of different theoretical positions which they might wish to take. Um, so rather than it, it becoming a, a book on state theory, we wanted to uh, make sure that it retained its focus as a, a book on extractive bargains. So some of the propositions which we which the book takes as uh, as axiomatic, uh, that the state has its own interests in pursuing its own, uh, ensuring its own continuity, that it does uh, have the capacity, if it chooses to act with some relative autonomy, to use uh, Poulance's term, um, that is to say it is capable of uh, disciplining uh, capital uh, and, or, and or factions of capital, uh, should it wish. And um, that, that is an option that it's not only a mouthpiece of capital, but ha has some uh, relative autonomy. Uh, it is a, uh, it seeks, it has two functions. Uh, it has to balance seeking legitimacy, uh, social legitimacy at the same time as uh, supporting forms of, of accumulation. Um, it is a, is a, is a complex set of institutions. So we do not analyze analyze it, view it as a unitary state, uh, but rather consisting of uh, different ministries which may have uh, different interests. 
the judiciary is as another uh, important part of the state, for example. So as well as uh, the executive functions and legislative functions, we also uh, want to include these other sets of institutions. Um, so that's one one side, the state, and of course I have to say something on society, another you know, difficult concept. Um, uh, so we define it broadly here, uh, the way in which we would include things, uh, parts of civil society, NGOs, social movements, uh, labor organizations, we include indigenous nations, uh, and we also include uh, capital, which is uh, which we regard as heterogeneous as well. Uh, so there is some uh, previous uh, literature on trying to look at these types of things. So there's some literature on extractive political settlements, um, but in our view that tends to be rather elite-based and ra rather static. Uh, there is some work on uh, what's called grand bargains. So um, you may recall the the bargain offered by uh, Ecuador to stop further extraction in parts of the, the Amazon in return for a large sum of uh, international funding. Uh, so this was a very specific type of, of grand bargain. Um, so we can find examples of those, but, but they are, they've been analyzed in a rather ad hoc manner. Um, and so we find these useful as a, as a starting point, but we want to uh, see if we can be more systematic and more comparative in, in, in what we do here. So we like the, the idea of bargains and, and our particular uh, definition here is the, the ways in which states attempt to convince different stakeholders and seek to establish some degree of consensus with societal actors about the new need to pursue particular policies on resource extraction, whether that be the continuation, expansion, or even reduction of extraction for some broader notion of societal good. So, uh, it's, uh, so it's looking at what is the state offering, what are its offerings uh, beyond and in addition to the direct uh, tax and employment. So it presupposes uh, some forms of societal engagement uh, other than violence. Uh, it is the, the notion of bargains is that they're directed at social actors seen as important. Uh, it may, and we'll, we can talk a little bit later on about how inclusively that's done or, or not. Um, it provides some kind of narrative by which the state can, can say, you know, we must have, uh, we must support these projects because we are supporting this, uh, this type of you know, larger aim. So there's a narrative which comes with it. Um, crucially that the outcomes are, are not predetermined. Um, so it depends upon, uh, the, the relative power positions of the actors and, uh, some extent, in some cases, uh, positions between states and civil societies are, are very asymmetrical in their in power, and in some cases, a little less so. It depends upon the, the skills and agency that uh, the different actors have. Um, so they're, they're dynamic. Um, they're capable of, of changing, of being renegotiated, of being resisted, of being rejected. Um, so it's it's an, it's an attempt to get uh, at, um, uh, how do states try to uh, negotiate these these broader uh, societal bargains, uh, even though you know, they, they may ultimately not be successful in doing so. Okay, um, so so there are sixteen case studies. Uh, they're just listed here, and we brought the uh, authors together and and had some kind of iterative and collaborative process where we said, you know, here are some possible categories that we might use. Um, do they fit your case or not? Um, and as a result of which some categories were rejected, some were uh, supported. And we went through this sort of process of trying to see uh, if we could find some commonalities between the, uh, the 16 countries. So, we looked at as we try, looked at two different types of extractive bargains. So we, we first asked, 
you know, what is being offered by the state and to whom? So how can we characterize what is being offered? So we call we call these analytical types. So this is the one axis, the analytical axis of uh, you know, what is being offered to whom, uh, in what form does it take? How can we characterize it? And then the, the second type is we not only want to say, well, what are these types of analytical bargains being offered, but uh, normat- normatively, how should we assess them? Uh, what are the implications for uh, social and environmental justice, which we take as being uh, the long-term goal and the short-term goal? Um, so, so we want to not only uh, provide some notion of what these bargains analytically might be, but also normative, normatively assess them. Um, so uh, we discovered that um, six different uh, ideal types, and what we can call ideal types of uh, analytical bargains. They're abstractions. Um, they vary uh, based on country specificities in, in practice. And we found that states may pursue different bargains at different times, and they may offer a number of bargains simultaneously, depending on if they want to uh, affect multiple constituencies. So these are the um, the bargains which which were identified through this iterative process uh, through the case studies. So I'm going to have to run through these very quickly. Uh, if you Google the book's title, you will find that this chapter one is on open access. Uh, so if any of you are suffering from insomnia, you can uh, read it at, at, at your leisure. Um, so, so just to run through very quickly, and I'm sorry, I, I will have to do so quite quickly without any examples, state examples. Um, so we have climate bargains where the state offers climate related commitments in exchange for resource extraction that appears to be consistent with some vision of sustainable development. Um, so. I said I wouldn't give country examples, but I will will just give uh, the Canadian example. So the Canadian uh, government offered new environmental, stricter environmental review processes, uh, new climate commitments, uh, federal carbon tax in exchange for um, it wanted support for increased uh, pipelines and exports of um, uh, oil. Um, from the from the tar sands, so this was its uh, what it was offering. Uh, um, in, in some cases, uh, we find that there are there are particular forms of uh, climate bargain where uh, states say they will um, uh, end extraction, whether that be a particular. Um, energy sources such as fossil fuels, or sometimes a particular. Uh, in particular practices such as fracking. So there is a big keep it in the ground movement, which some states uh, have followed. So France, Ireland, Denmark, I guess, give some examples, which we cover in the book of how they got to uh, what we call a post-extractive bargain. Uh, there are a number of states which have followed uh, what we call, in, adopted what we call indigenous focus bargains, where Given that uh, much natural, the, the natural resource frontier, extractive frontier is in many cases on indigenous territories, uh, many states have tried to come up with some policies uh, attempting to uh, address uh, directly uh, indigenous communities. There are uh, social redistribution bargains, uh, so expand resource extraction in exchange for the, the expected rents and being directly committed to social ex- inclusion or poverty reduction. So we can find that in, for example, the Pink Tide, but it's also you know, Latin America. There's also, uh, we can find it in Sweden as well. There's a, a whole set of independence bargains where, for example, in Greenland, um, when the, the new government, the self-government uh, took power in 2009, uh, it argued for increased mining uh, and, and onshore mining and oil exploration as a way of uh, getting, uh, completing its independence for, uh, from Denmark. We've seen uh, the similar types of independence arguments being used in, in Mexico. Uh, we're, we're seeing um, this happening in Europe with uh, arguments for new forms of energy development to replace uh, Russian natural gas as a result of the 
uh, uh, Ukraine war. So that's, that comes up in various forms too, as do uh, developmentalist bargains, where we can find, uh, mostly in the global south, uh, justifying ongoing resource extraction uh, as a means to finance broad-based national development projects and structural change. So there appear to be six different types of uh, analytically bargains which are, which states are following, which uh, come out of our particular uh, analysis. Okay, okay, I'm just going to finish then <laughs> uh, with uh, also talking about uh, normative uh, bargains, um, just to say, uh, so we, we view it as uh, critical not only to delineate what these bargains look like, but also to assess uh, whether they are desirable or, or not, who, who they're for, who they exclude, whether they move us in the, uh, in the direction of uh, long-term uh, environmental and social justice. If they do, we call those uh, progressive uh, bargains. We find that the, the, there aren't many examples of those. Um, there, are, there might be some constructive uh, bargains where um, bargains might show some promise in this way, but nevertheless, uh, more is needed, particularly institutionally. We can find examples of many examples of contradictory bargains uh, where it appears that uh, some parts of um, state policy is it might be deemed desirable, but other parts are in contradiction to it. This might be because uh, different ministries have different interests. So uh, the Ministry of Energy has different interests to uh, the Ministry of Environment, for example. Um, it can be due to cognitive dissonance where uh, states proclaim one thing but act in ways which are not consistent with it. So I was just come here from the UK where Prime Minister Sunak just said we're going to meet all our net zero uh, commitments by abolishing all the, all the ways to get there. Uh, so that could be cognitive dissonance or it could be uh, what we could also call organised hypocrisy, uh, a deliberate attempt to... Uh, to mislead uh, and the, the the last type of the, the, the far end of the most undesirable end of the spectrum would be Faustian bargains uh, where uh, short term gains for some uh, are at the are at the clear expense of long term uh, environmental and social justice so I'm going to have to stop there without giving you uh, any more examples, um, they come from uh, the chapters in, in the books. And we're lucky, very lucky to have one of the authors of one of those chapters with us to lead us through one case study. Thank you. We should now give the floor to Isabella. Should I stop sharing and share again? So thank you very much for the interesting presentation, Paul. I really enjoyed especially the categorization of the bargains. Yeah, I think it's very significant to do that work. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to present the book chapter I've written together with Maria Sa and Diego Andriucci on the plural economies in Bolivia and Ecuador. So in this book chapter, we discuss what kind of extractive bargains these countries' governments offer in order to what we call reconcile post-colonial pluralism. I will explain this terminology later on. The analysis is based on 63 qualitative interviews conducted in Bolivia and Ecuador from 2012 to 2017 with local producers in two case study locales, national leaders of indigenous organizations, as well as representatives of state institutions and state companies. Indigenous organizations have put forth unique proposals for plural economies in Bolivia and Ecuador that were constitutionally recognized in 2008 and 2009, respectively. The proposal for plural economies envisions empowering diverse economic forms, that is diverse reproductive activities, among them communitarian, that is collectively organized indigenous economic activities, which usually occur at small scales and for and or for subsistence. 
The proposal has been brought forth by indigenous organizations in alliance with other societal groups. And uh, these plural economies should be part of these countries' plurinational states, which recognize and are simultaneously reshaped through diverse indigenous and non-indigenous groups that partly self-identify as nations. And that's where the term plurinational comes from. In plurinational states, autonomous regions have been recognized. In Bolivia, for example, um, autonomies have been redefined at regional, departmental, municipal, and territorial levels. This has been considered a milestone, especially because they have included indigenous autonomous areas. Then sovereignty arrangements are the other key area identified by indigenous organizations to secure their livelihoods, territories, and subsistence activities. Here on the right-hand side of the slide, you see an article that I co-authored with Sarah Radcliffe. The title is Contested Sovereignties, Indigenous Disputes Over Plurinational Resource Governance. And we published it in 2023 in Environment and Planning e Nature and Space. In this article, we analyzed these indigenous organizations' very novel proposals for plural sovereignties in Bolivia and Ecuador. So these organizations claim that diverse groups need to hold sovereign rights over their territories in order to secure their livelihoods. And this all occurs within a national state territory. So they meant and mean to re renegotiate national sovereignty in light of this country's inter internal heterogeneity, its internal ethnic, political, and epistemological heterogeneity. In order to understand the limits of Andean plurinational development and also the specific extractive bargains that are offered by Bolivia's and Ecuador states, we draw on Latin American theoretical debates on plurinationalism. René Zavaleta is one of Latin America's most prominent intellectuals who theorized the state in postcolonial settings. He emphasized that various modes of production coexist within national territories and that diverse historical temporalities coexist within national territories. These modes of production are only partially articulated, so connected to each other, resulting in what is called, being called a motely overlapping, disjointed social formation. While for Savaleta, the condition of these motely overlapping, disjointed societies has been considered as a deficiency to be overcome, as it was seen as an obstacle both to capitalist and socialist development and therefore a problem, later scientists and social political movements have positively valued and politicized this condition. It was more specifically the indigenous movements and national organizations in both countries that have politicized this condition of the overlapping societies in order to propose um, the foundation of plurinational states. Bolivian political scientist Luis Tapia has developed this notion further, speaking of overlapping societies, highlighting capitalist and colonial development, and particularly the conditions of inequality and exploitation beneath the coexistence of such diverse overlapping societies. Here I quote him. Uh, he says, a coexistence does not automatically translate into functionalization and modernization towards capitalism, but rather, there is a long coexistence of colonial na nature with a set of economic, social, political, and cultural institutions that claim superiority over the rest and demand them to tribute to, uh, tribute to finance the reproduction of this type of formation and domination. I will come back to this idea later at the very end of the presentation. So here we will show how indigenous organizations renegotiated plural economies in Bolivia and Ecuador's plurinational states and analyze the tensions and contradictions that arise when plural economies are implemented in practice. Since the 1990s, indigenous groups have brought forward proposals for strengthening plural economies with the aim of recognizing and articulating diverse livelihoods with particular emphasis placed on their reproductive activities. A former leader of Ecuador's national indigenous organization, CONAIE, specifies the claim for a plural economic model as follows. I quote him, 
Our political project is to transform the Ecuadorian state according to the vision of a plurinational state. So the government system, the economic system shall no more be one sole system that dominates the others. Regarding the economic system, the best, strongest and richest system must comprise various economic systems because we are talking about various nations. We can also say pluralism. So it is about economic pluralism. He goes on and says, these systems will also help us to get out of any economic crisis and any crisis of the development model that is on the table since the capitalist system. That will not function anymore. We are already in a crisis. And for us, the alternative is to propose these economic systems in the plural. The political project of Ecuador's indigenous organization, CONAIE, from 1994, and also the slightly modified version from 2001, they both had an extensive section on a new economic model for a plurinational state. And we see similar proposals in Bolivia, where a former head of the Highland Indigenous Confederation, Konamak, explains that for them, a plural economic model implies strengthening a variety of economic forms. In contrast to Ecuador's organizations, however, Konamak also envisions direct indigenous participation in extractive economies. The example given is that of communitarian mining, which would only work with the so-called shared management, cogestion in Spanish, but with communitarian firms leading. It could be led by the populations of the places in which these resources are found. They can take over the company, but in shared management with the state. So we would have to see how much does the state contribute and how much the communitarian firm and how can they industrialize. So it is almost the same, but with originary nations on top. Um, Co-ownership of land, natural resources has also been a central claim when indigenous, originary and peasant organizations formed a common alliance, the so-called Unity Pact in Bolivia in 2004. Following long periods of discussion and deliber deliberation within and among indigenous peasant organizations, as well as in both countries' constitutional assemblies, these proposals were recognized in Bolivia's and Ecuador's constitutions of 2009 and 2008, respectively. In the Bolivian constitution, we find Article 306 that specifies the Bolivian economic model is plural and oriented towards improving the life quality and towards good living, vivir bien of all Bolivians. The plural economy is constituted through the communitarian, the state, the private, and the social cooperative economic forms of organization. The plural economy articulates the different economic organizational forms by means of the principles of complementarity, reciprocity, solidarity, redistribution, equality, legal security, sustainability, balance, justice, and transparency. The social and communitarian economy complements the individual interest with the collective vivirbien. In Ecuador's constitution, we have Article 283 that specifies the economic system is social and solidary. It recognizes the human being as subject and as end. It aims at a dynamic and balanced relationship between society, state, and market in harmony with nature. And it has as, as objective guaranteeing the production and reproduction of the material and immaterial conditions that enable the good living, buen vivir. The economic system is integrated through the public, the private, the mixed, the popular and solidary economic forms of organization, alongside others determined in the constitution. The popular and solidary economy is regulated according to the law and includes the cooperative, the associative and the communitarian sector. In theory, therefore, annex, we argue that an extractive bargain was struck between the central state and indigenous and peasant organizations in which extraction would only would continue, but within the context of constitutionally protected and promoted plural economies. In practice, however, we will show how plural economies have suffered, suffered severe backlashes, which is most visible when resource extraction projects are implemented and threaten the existing other than extractive reproductive forms. 
So now we trace the practice of plural economies in the context of mining activities in Wanuni, Bolivia, and Intac, Ecuador. So um, first we have the Pozoconi Mountain, you see it here in the picture, which reaches almost 5,000 meters above sea level, and it is located in the Indian mountain range, just southeast of La Paz, in the municipality and town of Wanuni. While it represents Bolivia's biggest tin mine, there are also other diverse reproductive activities that secure people's livelihoods in the region. In 2009, indigenous peasant groups achieved a great success in defense of their livelihoods. As Supreme Decree 0335 declared the Popo Lake Basin, where Wanoni is located, an environmental emergency zone. The president of a local peasants organization said that the decree awoke much hope for farmers, animal breeders, and fishers, fishers suffering the severe contamination from mining, who mobilized to defend their reproductive activities. But almost a decade later, the decrees of objectives were not met. I interviewed a mother and her daughter who are dedicated to small scale cultivation of mainly potatoes, quinoa and corn and animal breeding in San Agustin de Punyaca. And they say, there is no water for irrigation, only the water from the rain. We don't have water here. The Wanuni mine is the one that contaminates most, the River Popo. It is all red. A leading member of the uh, Departmental Service of Agriculture and Animal Breeding, Sedak, added that long-term remediation plans are needed. We are still addressing these problems like firemen, beet droughts or contamination. Here he, ref he refers to the contamination of soils and the drying up of Lake Popo. The Secretary for the Environment, Water and Mother Earth of Oruro said that this contamination dates back 500 years. It persists since colonial times, and today we are facing degraded soils. So the second case study locale is Intac, Ecuador. In Ecuador's Intac region, copper exploration dates back to the early 1990s. Communities in the Inter region of Ecuador prevented copper mining activities from starting over 18 years, arguing that these would thwart the reproductive activities of the region. Not only is Intag located amidst a mega diverse cloud forest between 1,800 and 2,800 meters above sea level, and it is one of the world's 25 biodiversity hotspots. Moreover, a variety of economic activities are being practiced here. These include organic coffee cultivation alongside tropical fruit, cacao, corn, beans, potatoes, tree tomatoes, sugarcane, and bananas. Also, ecotourism, rural communitarian tourism projects, as well as artisanal production of cosmetics grew strong in the region. The defense of productive diversity has been a major motivation for rejecting mining activities in the region. However, despite strong opposition that aimed at defending reproductive diversity, the Ecuadorian mining company managed to break the resistance in 2009. That was a time of rising copper prices. A member of Intex Women Coordination complains that they were suffering a tenacious attack by the government, that their rights and the constitution itself were not respected. An authority of Cotacachi's municipality government lays out that they have exhausted all possibilities for participation. The municipality wanted to carry out popular consultations, but this possibility was taken away from them through a constitutional change in December 2015. Then over 80 observations they had made to the environmental impact assessment were not taken into account. They also tried to conform a citizen oversight committee, but finally they say, I quote, the company surpassed us and they formed their own committee. So we see that democratic rights for participation and decision making around resource exploitation have been plainly suspended. A member of Intax Women Coordination explains that there is no possibility to actually participate in political decision making. She says, in the face of this, we feel impotent, defenseless. There are no laws that protect us. The law is just being implemented when it is for the miners. It is not applicable for the peasants. The municipality is well-intentioned, but the government decides from above. 
the authority of Kotakachi's municipal government concludes that this constitutes what he calls a shielding of mining companies that they experience in Intak. He explains, they are taking away all our legal possibilities to work. They have achieved an interweaving, a legal structure that shields mining companies. I am progressively realizing that no matter what you do, they have a sort of shield around the mining companies. Around them, there can happen a thousand things, but they are impermeable. They go ahead with their work, their plans. Nothing affects them, nothing perturbs them. The mining companies have a lot of experience for creating this interweaving. And here they have found the perfect form with a government with popular support, referring to the pro them um, progressive government of Korea that could break the resistance of the people in Intak. So we see that fundamental political rights of people in Wanuni and Intak have been and are being suspended. And indigenous organizations proposals for plural economy can be understood as a, as a strategy in response to that. So in response to the suspension of population's fundamental and political rights. We have called this political dispossession in an article published in 2021 with our Bolivian co-author Marx Chavez Leon and Diego Andreucci. On the right hand side of the slide, you see the article that we published in the Journal of Political Ecology. We decided to publish it in Spanish with the title Expansión Extractivista, Resistencia Comunitaria y Despojo Político en Bolivia. In this article, we show that in sites of resource extraction, political dispossession takes place. That is, people are being dispossessed of their political voice and their spaces of decision-making and participation. So in conclusion, we see that indigenous agendas for plural economies have sought to address colonial legacies of social and social environmental inequality According to Tapia, post-colonial contexts are characterized by overlapping societies, that is one dominant colonial society that lives off the others, that consumes them, that uses up the time and resources required for their self-development. In Bolivia and Ecuador, the extractive bargain proposed allowing extractivism to continue, but only as part of plural economies, which permit, facilitate and encourage the existence and expansion of other than extractive economic sectors and forms of social organization, including non-capitalist ones. In practice, however, extractive activity has undermined rather than coexisted with other economic forms and generated resistance as a result. So what is needed therefore is to, is to strengthen the power of the plurinational organizations which would enable them to effectively contest the decisions of the central state. Nonetheless, we think that the constitutionally recognized proposal for plural economies holds the potential to create more equality between and among different economies, economic forms and reproductive activities, but only if and when such post-colonial power dynamics are taken into account. And last but not least, they hold the potential to balance tensions that build up in economic crisis arising from capitalist colonial dynamics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Isa. So, Suppose we can take uh, a few questions from the audience now. Should we start with people that are here? Or? Thank you so much for the presentation to the to the board. Um, my my question is related to the human rights due diligence mandatory duties or obligation. Here in in Europe, we are discussing uh, the due diligence uh, parameter as a mandatory rule 
that me that must uh, incorporate uh, that must incorporate uh, in companies uh, big companies uh, generally speaking uh, do you think that this mandatory rule could be uh, correct the asymmetry in the bargain extractivism can, can be this a uh, good public policy for example the the due diligence mandatory thank you Okay, uh, uh, thanks very much uh, for your question. Um, I think I'll, I'll answer that by with reference to one of the, the chapters in, in the book, if I might, um, which is that I didn't get to speak at the, in my uh, set of bargains, there was one seventh bargain, which I didn't talk about, which was so-called parallel bargains. Um, so in that chapter, what, what we looked at is we said, uh, we looked at all the Green New Deals or that are being proposed by various states around the world and uh, asked, uh, in, in light of the fact that if they all came to pass in, in any form, then the amount of extraction of minerals to support them is huge. Uh, so what is happening at the international level to... Uh, what sort of global extractive bargain might there be? Uh, is is there one being put in place to deal with this large increase in trade in, in minerals, that, which would result from this energy transition? And uh, basically, our, 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 what we found was that no, there isn't. <laughs> uh, no one is really thinking about those things. That the Green New Deals are very domestically focused. Uh, and so the regulation of those you know, of trade in those uh, areas and the governance of trade is sort of exist is uh, relying on what we call parallel uh, bargains, so the existing institutions, um, which uh, in this case um, are things like uh, the UN Global Compact, the Global Reporting Initiative. The extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the Voluntary Principles on Business Security and Human Rights, etc. Um, so, uh, so we argue that there is a, a big gap in terms of a global, a new global extractive bargain to look at uh, how, uh, if we are going to transition towards more uh, the mining of more critical minerals and global trade in them how is that going to be governed how are those things going to be managed uh, and we argue that um rather than taking a starting point of green of the new deal something affecting uh, capitalist economies in, in the 1930s as the, the starting point a lens which uh, leaves out much of the global south what would happen if you took a uh, a particular global south starting point, namely the, the new international economic order of the 1970s, and took that as the starting point for rethinking how a global extracted bargain might look like. And one of the points that comes up in that is precisely that uh, global corporations should be held accountable uh, globally for their activities everywhere. So the sort of long-winded answer to you to your question is that it is it could be it could be part of a, a rethinking of a global uh, global um, mineral governance, um, which would, uh, with other factors too, lead to a renegotiation of a sort of a new bargain about uh, how the conditions under which uh, corporations act globally. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, the the first question was from Carol Costa. I don't know, Carol, if you're there, maybe you could ask it um, directly. If you can unmute yourself. 
Um, sure. Um, I've asked uh, about the, the theoretical framework for for that conceptualization on the state that was presented right in the beginning of the presentation. If if you used any specific conceptualization, any specific author, or if it was um, well an amalgamation of of some conceptualizations that you created for the book specifically. Uh, th thanks, Carol. Um, so, uh, when, when so, so if you look at our uh, sixteen countries, they're a very diverse group, very different types of uh, political systems, um, uh, different forms of economic structure. And when we when we brought people together, we didn't want to uh, impose a particular theoretical framework. Uh, and on them in terms of the state, but um, rather allowing, um, providing guidelines, if you like, drawn from uh, a diverse literature um, and enabling uh, authors, contributors to place themselves uh, within, within that, uh, within that particular framework um, so that uh, so that they could draw on whatever frameworks they felt were most relevant for their own uh, case studies. So we provided guidelines which um, um, came mostly from uh, from well, sort of Marxist theories of the state. Although I would say that we we sort of broadened it, so I, I would call them more Marxist than Marxist. Um, so. Uh, so that the emphasis on the, the dual emphasis on legitimacy and accumulation, uh, how the state negotiates those types of things. Uh, although some authors took uh, more um, more directly Weberian approaches, where the state was seen as actually you know quite autonomous from from capital and society. And so I think we have a, a sort of a range of theoretical uh, issues there, which we felt was was willing to, we were willing to uh, to allow that in order to try and draw out uh, extractive bargains in, in the different country contexts thank you very much thanks should we go ahead or unless anyone's got no, go for the next one online there was one from Karen I don't know if Karen you're still here and you're able to ask directly. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is mainly concerning the um, treaty being considered by the EU. Um, having attended a, a call about what's in this treaty, it sounds like a dream come true for anybody who wants to do an extraction, but it also sounds like the worst nightmare uh, for many of these nations uh I think Ecuador and um, Colombia, uh, Mexico, uh, and several, Argentina in particular, you know, in terms of importing foodstuffs and chemicals that really can't even be sold or used in Europe, uh, it allows for this. So it seems to be um, a really disastrous treaty. And I wonder if this is something that... <clears throat> You're aware that people are uh, talking about in Europe and um, having any impact to help because I think presentations like yours are what will help people see that this is not a very good idea. Um, and just any comments from panels or others uh, about what's going on in, in the EU about this, this treaty, which will probably be voted on relatively soon. Lisa, did you want to try and take that? 
I think this question wasn't really for me, but I would go after Paul or you and then answer to, to all the questions <laughs> as they also relate to, to my presentation. So I, I made notes and have some responses then. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for your question, Karen. I, I, I don't know very much about the, the EU treaty uh, which you're re referring to. Um, it sounds like uh, uh, a particular bargain that is uh, based upon uh, substantially asymmetric power relations and is, would lead to a uh, to a Faustian bargain from the point of view of the uh, the global south countries on the end of it, but um, on the receiving end of it. Both the free trade agreement um, and it, it's been in negotiations for the last 20 years. So if you think about 20 years ago, how it might have begun in terms of um, justice and environment, um, you, you've got a pretty good idea of <laughs> the terms. Um, and supposedly these countries are modernizing their, uh, their part on, in the treaty, uh, to, uh, address some of the super inequalities. But, uh, I, I think just the import and export, the export of, of minerals and extracted materials, the um, focus on importing chemicals that would allow for mega farms uh, in in these nations using chemicals and pesticides um, that would allow for certain kinds of uh, genetically modified foods to grow there that are not currently there and how people will be displaced from these lands um, to do these mega farms uh it, it's it's catastrophic we already know it's catastrophic in the usa so uh we're taking measures to to stop that but i think those companies are are pressing for it to move south so anyway uh, you may want to inform yourselves anybody on the call of what's going on with that and and begin to lobby against it um from your with your EU um, representatives, uh, it's and I think you can Google the trade agreement and find out what's going on with it. Um, I was pretty concerned because it sounds like the U.S. and these giant uh, agro corporations are moving south. Thank you, Karen. I'm thinking maybe both from the perspective of the book, we could we could consider free trade agreements as way or ways of circumventing or or sabotaging the, the state society bargains, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it adds another layer of, of complexity to to what we're what we're discussing here, and I think the the point that Karen raises is uh, you know it's very very important, very significant how these trade deals are uh, putting straight jackets on what states can actually do and the, the, how these bargains change over time is actually very interesting. What we, what we call extractive bargains change over time is very interesting in the era of neoliberalism where uh, states have become more constrained and uh, as Karen shows, uh, demonstrates another way in which they're being going to be further constrained. Uh, at the same time, there has also been, uh, as I think in Isabella's uh, talk show, um, a, a resurgence or a, uh, in Indigenous rights in many countries, uh, in, including in Canada, which has uh, shifted and tried to push uh, in, in the other direction. So I think there are you know, it's very important to examine these the way in which these bargains evolve over time in response to new events and, and agency of particular uh, groups. Um, there was a question that I think might be for Isabella from uh, Bayar. So I might not be pronouncing it well, but I don't know um, if you're there, Bayar. Do you want to ask yourself or I can read out if not? 
Yeah, you can read out my. Yeah, I think if it's understandable. Otherwise, I can. I can. I, I can read it out if you want me to, and then I answer to all of the questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if that helps. Okay. Uh, so the, I'm looking. So it says I'm looking at the mining operations in Mongolia, South Gobi. Mongolia is a somewhat democratic state, and allows and acknowledges different ownership rights in mining. My question is. Does the ownership status of mining companies influence the state's approach towards them? And if it does, what are the typical attitudes or stances that state commonly adopt? Um, I'm not sure I have a clear, I think it's a very interesting question <laughs> because it sheds light, light on a very specific aspect that needs to be taken into account in research. So I would actually rather take it as a comment than as, as a question so that we should focus on the ownership start of, of mining companies and ask if this changes states' approaches or other political or social dynamics. So I would rather leave it there. Because to be honest, I think I think it's a really good point, and I would need to think about it in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia and the two the two case studies. Um, I thanks thanks for pointing that out. Um, then I have a couple of answers to previous comments and questions. First, uh, regarding the global legal framework. So I think for the cases that I present, yes, they are of very high importance. So we need to hold companies accountable for what they do at the sites of extraction. So I think that is crucial. Uh, that would be my answer. And then I would also add, and of course, it depends on how it is being inscribed into law. And then it depends on how law is being put into practice, as we see in the case of Bolivia and Ecuador's plural economies, where we see that there is a, a problem between... So these plural economies have been... Uh, have been recognized in this country's constitutions to a very, very la large extent. Uh, however, we see that that in that the in the practice that in the in practice these plural economies cannot flourish because of prevailing power dynamics. So that's one issue. And then another issue that we came across regarding these legal frameworks is um, that article that I mentioned on the plural sovereignties in Bolivia and Ecuador. Here, we tr in that article, we trace indigenous organizations' proposals for plural economies in Bolivia and Ecuador, and their proposals are very wide-reaching because they, like, they, uh, they point at the colonial core of resource governance, and that they they say that the colonial core is in centralized sovereignty arrangements that presuppose a homogeneous national population. And so they they want to break this colonial core and introduce sovereignty multiplicity. So they say that different groups need to hold sovereign rights over their territories in order to secure their livelihoods. However, we see that in this case, the proposals are not even recognized by law or in this country's constitution. So there we see that it didn't even come to recognizing them in law, because we see that the Bolivian and Ecuadorian constitutions, the, first they distinguish between political and economic sovereignty, um, and then they distinguish between indigenous and non-indigenous people. So, um, so they 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 don't give these sovereign rights to indigenous people. So, I think I personally think that legal frameworks are extremely important. We also have a um, quote in our chapter from a Bolivian intellectual, Oscar Vega Camacho, who says that the constitutions are a point of departure, but they are not our point of arrival. <laughs> and that's how I would see frameworks in general. But I I I think that we, I personally think that that we need, we still need to fight for these frameworks. Um, then there was another question regarding the global scale that was the global finances. I don't have a direct answer to the global finances. For my case studies, I can just say that, um, I mean, it's also, I mean, everybody knows it, yeah, that the, um, the Ecuadorian government broke the resistance in Ecuador in a time when, when mineral prices were high. And that's that's what, what, what happens very often. Then, I have um, two questions or comments regarding the states so, and, and the one on the partisan effect. Yeah. Is, Isa, can you actually read the question to us? Because we're not, we can't see them. Ah, um, no, the, 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 these are questions that were raised before. Uh, so the one was how is the state being conceptualized? And I also think, um, and also reading the introduction of, of the book, I also think that it, 
puts the like it raises questions about the conceptualization of state. So I think we should rethink and reconceptualize the state based on these insights, uh, also empirical insights, like the case of of Bolivia and Ecuador short and the case of plurinationalism shows that, for example, indigenous groups in these countries challenge the way we conceptualize the state. And then there is one question that I will read because that's in the chat. Um, it regards the partisan effect. Um, I will find it just in a second. So, um, okay, sorry, I hear. Can you speak to whether your research has found if cases have reflected a partisan effect on whether governments feel obliged, so to say, to engage in extractive bargains? Um, I don't have a straightforward question to that answer, but I can say something on a partisan effect that we found in the article that I mentioned, um, Expansión Extractivista Resistencia Comunitaria Despojo Político en Bolivia, co-authored with Marx Chavez Leon Diego Andriotti in the Journal of Political Ecology. And there uh, we trace how um, the state contributes and the government, like we have three case studies. One is uh, hydrocarbon exploitation. The other one is um, um, hydroelectricas, hydroelectrics project. And the third one is the construction of a, of a highway. And there we trace how the state and the government, it, it's also very much about an extractive bargain actually, because First, they encounter a lot of resistance, and then they go to the territories and talk to the people and try to convince them and offer them presents, as we all know. And it's, yeah, it's really a bad deal because they offer them really small things. Um, and 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 so they so they or they in they even op opened a small military school in one place, you know, which reinforces the sub the oppression of of the resistance in the place, you know. And um, and there we see that that government under Evo Morales, which I think it was really progressive in many ways, but it did also perpetuate certain what we call colonial legacies um, as they continued dispossession and also political dispossession of, of, of these groups. And there we see a partisan effect because we see that these governments had popular support and other governments like the, governments, the government of Janine Añez that followed Evo Morales um, in a non-democratic way. Um, she wouldn't have been able to enter these territories in the same way because the government had popular support. So that's how they could dispose of peop uh, people, communities, uh, politically more easily. Do I, is it understandable what I say or should I explain it a little bit more? So there we clearly found a partisan effect. That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. I just want to see if there's any other questions from from the room. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe another comment because uh, I want to to hear about something related to China because you're about related to your experience. I I think that Karen pointed out a, a very a huge problem because Europe and USA maybe are in the same. Um, an umbrella related to Washington consensus, the, uh, the, w, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, investment treaties, uh, free trade agreements. We, we are in the same, um, economy, uh, logic, logic. Uh, so my question is related to China because China maybe it can be offered a different view. I don't know. Uh, Yesterday was the reunion related to the Belt and Road Initiative, and and China is offered a, a a view related to the ecological civilization. Do you think uh, it, uh, this view can be the the a new way to 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 do uh, extractivism, or is more <laughs> the the same uh, that, that that we know right now? <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for your question. That's a there's a whole lot in that question. Um, at several different uh, several different levels uh, about whether uh, China offers an alternative to the Washington Consensus, uh, about whether China offers a model for future technological development, whether it's 
uh, whether it's extractivism uh, is a model. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and uh, I, I can't possibly answer all those things. So um, I'll try and just say a couple, a few things about that. Um, so on, on your point about uh, does it offer an alternative to WTO, et cetera, of course, uh, China claims that it is a, a leader of the global south uh, in negotiations at, uh, at WTO level, etc. Um, and and in, in many, and by ar- by continually arguing for um, you know, differential treatment, uh, it it seeks to to play play that card and, and get support for it. And of course, in the way in which the, the Chinese political economy works um, is is very different from a, from a from an Anglo-American model of the variety of capitalism and and so it's the developmental state um, which it's it still adheres to in many important ways. Um, it has proven to be a more, um, you know, an attractive point through the, through the interesting special issue of Third World Quarterly that was uh, came out a few couple of years ago called Developmental States Beyond East Asia, where uh, the idea of extractive developmental states was came out, and you know, to what extent are other country, other states in in Latin America or uh, or Africa attempting to follow some kind of East Asian developmentalist model you know, on the debate whether they are or not or the success they're having but clearly there is a, a pull towards that type of alternative for, for some countries but at the same time China's continuing subsidies of cotton and uh, its policies on fisheries etc have also caused it to have lots of frictions with other members of the, the global south as well so China is a complex case where uh, in some kind of abstract model, it looks as if it's a, uh, possibly a, a different a counterpoint to the Washington consensus view. But in terms of some of its practice, trade practices, it, uh, it also uh, has creates lots of frictions with other global South countries. Um, in terms of uh, extractive extractivisms and extractive bargains we do actually have, have a, a chapter in the book on china and you know we wondered whether china is such a big player we, we thought well we really ought to know something about what's going on there but how well it fits the model and uh, we don't don't know we'll have to find out by asking a country expert on extractives in china and it uh, it kind of uh, comes back to the the question that uh, bayer asked too uh, about what happens when um state-owned enterprises are dominant in the extractive industries. Uh, when we have a notion of a, of, a, of a bargain, who is the state bargaining with? Is it bargaining with itself in terms of its own uh, extractive industries and state-owned enterprises? And in the uh, in the China chapter, uh, the, the author there argues that um, there is a very particularistic Chinese context within which this the, the bargain happens um, with uh, what she does is she looks at the, the number of disputes that uh, were occurring in mining areas. There's, so there's there were, um, conflicts uh, within mining uh, regions and she shows from the official data how those were uh, increasing over the 2000s. And the state responded um, by introducing new policies for about 275 uh, identified resource-rich cities. And it, it brought in a set of uh, economic, environmental, uh, social laws, which were aimed at uh, disciplining capital, state capital, i.e. its own 
you know, parts of it, parts of the state, but also foreign capital, in how they engage with and what the benefits would be for local communities. So what the author calls it, what Jing Vivian Jan calls the local resource curse. And, and she then sort of looks at what the content of those policies were, and then takes a look at what happened to you know, conflicts in mining areas after that. And they show a, a decrease. Now, whether that's a result of those laws, whether it's a result of different reporting or not re non-reporting, whether it's other political crackdowns and where protests has become more difficult, you know, we don't know, but we can see this correlation, even if we don't know the causality. So she argues that there is this sort of so there's no, no, there are no civil society organizations involved in this uh, bargain. So for whom is the bargain? With whom? How does it take place? It's a state and some factions of capital intended to uh, support what the, the Chinese government uses, quote, harmony, unquote. So there is this, these very sort of particularistic ways in which this occurs in these countries. In, in China, whether one would view that as progressive or not is an entirely different uh, issue on our uh, normative angle, on our normative axis, but on the analytical axis, that's what we think is happening. Yeah, there's not too much longer. There's a couple more questions online. I don't know if Diego, if you had anything that you wanted to ask or say or comment or. No, okay. Because I know uh, Alicia that you had another question or another couple of questions. If you want, maybe want to just pick one because we don't have too much longer. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Sure. Um, I th I think maybe I'll ask the question about international finance, if that's okay. I think Isabella, you touched on it um, quite briefly, but uh, maybe uh, Dr. Bowles, if you or Paul, if you have any insight into it either. Um, the question is uh, whether you found that extractive bargains um, and the way that states engage in extractive bargains is at all influenced by international finance. So I'm thinking of the cases of loans from international financial institutions um, to support extraction or oil-backed loans, for example, um, or even trade agreements, as we were speaking to earlier, um, that might cover extractive industries, um, like with regard to lithium, for example, in Latin America. Um, so I, I'm not sure if maybe you have some insight onto that. And also thank you for the presentation. I just got my hands on the book and excited to read it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, no, I don't, we don't have much in the book on that, uh, actually. So, um, you know, I said at the outset that the that uh, this is exploratory work and wanted to see whether you know it's worth pursuing further and that there are a whole set of uh, further questions uh, to be asked one was the the ownership issue which uh, Bayer raised um, you know are there differences between federal and non-federal states uh, authoritarian versus democratic states and the, the, another extension I think is the one that you have raised here about you know the whole role of international finance in this where we, we talk fairly obliquely about um, you know, global constraints uh, without really looking at those in, in any detail and sort of so in focusing on, on the nation state we, we um, uh, largely on the nation state those some of those things have sort of washed out a little bit and maybe need to be brought back in well on trade agreements one of the, and on trade in general one of the interesting things in, in the Mexican case, for example, um, was that uh, extractivism was viewed uh, as under NAFTA, and it, that led to a huge increase in um, investment, uh, foreign in foreign investment, particularly by Canadian companies as well as US, into the uh, Mexican uh, mineral sector, metal mineral and metal sector, um, and so that trade agreement, uh, which of course, then immediately tr triggered the resistance in uh, Chiapas, um, set the scene for a, a new round of extractivism. So it was very important in in the in the state's discourse then of um, of how, why free trade would, would be a good thing because it would spur this this investment. Um, but then under the Trump administration, 
Uh, interestingly, then, uh, because the, tr the Trump administration took a hard line uh, on um, the manufacturing sector in in, um, in Mexico, arguing that um, you know, it would have been arguing for an increase in, in wages and, and uh, labor rights and um, trying to decrease imports from Mexico from the Me Mexican uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, then uh, natural resource exports were then seen as being a compensatory mechanism, giving Mexico some independence from the attack on their manufacturing sector. So it's, it's so as we say over time, that the, the narratives of shift um, and, but it does show the, the implications of these, how trade disputes and trade agreements can, can affect the way in which states try to frame the particular bargain. So I don't think that really answers your question, but that's a, just a, a comment on it. I think it's good insight. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks that. Isabella, did you want to hear, add anything to that question? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, no, not to that question. I think I, not, not immediately. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, yeah, there was one last comment in, um, last comment in from, from Karen. Um, do we have time? We've we got a few minutes more because we started a bit, <laughs> if you've got a couple of minutes um yeah mm -hmm. yeah karen if you if you want to just quickly uh transmit your last question that would be great thanks um uh, again uh we have indigenous uh territories in the united states um that are independent nations and um at this point in history they are uh um, included in decisions about mining and extraction. It wasn't always that way in the past, I don't believe. Um, there was a lot of pollution and problems that arose in those countries, uh, nations that uh, persist through today. But waterways, um, some of those nations have, have protections uh, of, of waterways that move through their territories and and even go beyond their territories, but um, just forwarding that as an option that may be important in constitutions that talk about uh, sovereign nations, that mineral rights and waterway rights um, are should be included in, in those territorial um, identifications as uh, decision-making people. Who, make, who decides, you know, uh, and and water um, pollution is currently one of the easiest ways uh, in the U.S. to stop a polluting uh, industry from coming in, whether it's agricultural or um, more industrial in, uh, industry. So uh, it's used locally by um, even townships and um, counties. Uh, and for state issues as well. Um, so it works pretty well, um, but that needs to be recognized, you know, that water rights are, are need to be protected and that people have the right to protect the water. That's all I have to say. Um, uh, and as far as China, what I see in East Africa is this construction of this uh, petroleum pipeline that goes from Tanzania uh, through to the coast. And um, do not be surprised if you see very polluting uh, industrial uh, petroleum-based industries like plastics and things like that popping up along this pipeline um, that is displacing really hundreds of thousands of people who have no interest in having this pipeline at all. You know, it, it's not part of how they see themselves as people or how they see their nation. Um, and uh, that 
kind of was ignored when this whole caboodle started. But um, a nation moving its pollution to another place, maybe uh, where the resources are closer at hand. Um, I think it's what's happening with China here, but it happens with the USA, US all the time. Um, so who owns the factory? Who owns the mine is always something worth finding out about. Yeah. Uh, waiting for Isa's comments <laughs> uh, in the chat. Uh, unless someone has a, Paul, do you have any final reflections to share? Uh, no, just uh, thank everybody for their engagement with, uh, with today's presentations and panel, and th thank you for spending your, your time here, here with us.